Um, well, good morning and welcome to the Terry Leadership Speaker Series. My name is Kevin Chattel. I am a junior mass media arts student from Grayson, Georgia, and I'm also a proud Institute for Leadership Advancement Leadership Fellow. This morning, I have the honor of introducing to everyone Mr. Christopher Breerton. Mr. Breerton has been recognized as a leading lawyer in both the entertainment and the sports fields. He was included in the Hollywood Reporter's Power Lawyers list in 2013 and has consistently been named in Best Lawyers in America for Entertainment Law for the last four years. Mr. Breerton advises motion picture studios, independent producers, financial institutions, investment funds, television networks, and sports organizations. He was formerly a certified public accountant with KPMG in Los Angeles and is now a partner for Latham & Watkins LLP. Mr. Breerton graduated from Terry College in 1992 and went on to receive his JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Christopher Breerton. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so we just did kind of a formal introduction, but I'm sure everyone is curious um, to know a little bit more about who the real Christopher Breerton is. Everyone. If you will just tell us about your journey and kind of how you got to it. Um, okay. First of all, unless you're mad at me, I'm Chris. Uh, unless, unless my father or my wife is mad at me, that's only when Christopher comes out. But uh, yeah, I, I uh, had a bit of, a, of an unusual journey to get to Georgia. I, um, I moved around a lot as a kid. My father was a nomadic accountant, which um, I understand is a program that's going to be offered here going <laughs> forward. Um, I lived in seven different states, went to 14 different schools. I went to high school in Houston, Texas, Sacramento, California, and ultimately Columbus, Georgia for my senior year. And, and so, of course, um, rather than just going up the street when it was time for me to pick, I went to Los Angeles. So my freshman year of college, I actually went to Southern Cal. Um, I was a competitive swimmer in high school, and when I got to Southern Cal, I was going to walk on the swim team, and swimming, I don't know if any of you are swimmers, uh, it's an empirically not a fun sport. It's rewarding, but not in terribly enjoyable. Um, they had the world record holder in my event, and I quickly figured out that uh, it may not be so rewarding to swim every day against that person. Uh, so, I, so I stopped swimming, and I just became a regular student. And in the summer, my parents said to me, you know, we don't like you being so far away. Um, we, uh, you gave up your childhood dream. We really think you should, um, you should, you know, consider going somewhere more local and, and swimming again. And so this was about August before my sophomore year was about to start. And so I, I hopped in a car with a buddy and came up here from Columbus and I toured the campus and I loved it. And I immediately just felt like college. It just had something special about it. And I was sitting at UD's, which is now Starbucks. It was, it was a phenomenal Philly cheesesteak place back then. Mm. And I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this. And so I, I hailed a cab to the pool. I found Jack Bowerly. And I said, listen, I'm Chris Breerton. I currently go to USC. I currently have pretty good grades. And I used to be fast in the pool. Uh, and if you'll let me go to college here, I'll be a great teammate and student. And you'll be proud of me. Um, he said, let me get back to you. And a week later, he said, get up here. And that's where the journey began. So it was not exactly a straight line. But one of the things that I think you guys will find is very few things are a straight line. And that's just fine. And in fact, um, so that happened in a very odd way. Two weeks later, before school had even started, I was in a room much like this. I looked in the audience and I saw a girl and I asked who she was. And I was told, well, that's Jenny. She's on the track team. And that night I met her, a week later I had the courage to ask her out, and 25 years later she's still with me. So the, the bottom line is you never know what's going to happen, but it's generally pretty good. And uh, I've had the good fortune of coming back to school. Uh, every year I get to at least two to three football games. Mm -hmm. um, I moved to L.A. in 1992, and in 1994 I brought two guys back with me to see Georgia play because I explained to them that it was much better than the Pac-10. Uh, just, you just, you have to see it to believe it. And now, uh, we're on our 20, uh, 21st anniversary of what we call the Southern Excursion. And as Katrina and others have seen, I, I'm generally on campus at least once a year with about 22 or 25 guys from LA in the North Lawn, all excited to be here. So it's, it's a very special place to me, but it started out in a very unusual way to get here. Fantastic. So ladies and gentlemen, you can find your future husband or wife here today. So <laughs> look forward to that. Um, so you were a Terry College of Business student. I was. Um, I and was. what did you um, learn in Terry College that you have applied to your career? Um, anything in particular that stands out? 
Well, there, there was actually, it was strange. There's there one thing that really resonates with me, and I don't even remember the class or the professor, and that's, that's bad of me, but the experience was, it was a team experience. So I was a classic type A, a straight arrow uh, student, and this was a team experience. You had to get together with a group of students. And I remember thinking that when I was assigned my team, I thought, I was very upset with the configuration of the students because I, I, I didn't think they were maybe the, some of the stronger students in the class. I was a little bewildered. You were doing all the weight. All I, the I was worried about my grade mm -hmm. and how I'd have, to, I'd have to do all the work. And then midway through the project, it clicked. This was the entire purpose of the project, yeah. to put people together that were different, that had different strengths. And it was up to the group to figure out how to maximize all of our strengths for our collective benefit for our grade. And it was really an experience that was one of the more life-changing academic experiences of my life because we did pull together, we did get an A, collectively we did that. And now, 20 some odd years later, what I am doing on a day-to-day -day basis for big clients is putting together a deal team to tackle a very challenging transactions. And it's made up of a lot of different individuals with different skill sets, oftentimes in different geographies. Mm -hmm. and Pooling those talents together to have the proverbial whole is greater than the sum of the parts yeah. is a lesson I really learned here um, in a workshop. And you're talking about bringing teams together and doing deals. Can you tell us more about what exactly you do and, and what kind of lawyer you are? And, and so everyone doesn't know what a deal lawyer does. All those TV shows about transactional laws. Uh, uh, now it's a very it's a very interesting field. And what I do in particular is slightly different than the average attorney because I'm I'm an industry practice. Uh, I work solely and exclusively in entertainment and sports and on the deal side. So I, I've never been to court, ever, um, it, and hopefully never will. Um, I spend all of my time in boardrooms, in, on conference calls, flying around, meeting with people. And what I do is I essentially, um, I represent clients and their interests in trying to achieve a goal. And so. These are, some of, these are some of my clients, and so maybe an easy thing to do is to talk about one of them. So a deal that, that we concluded recently, uh, which is sort of indicative, is I do a lot of work with MGM, the Motion Picture Studio. And they are very strong in feature film, and they are strong in scripted type. But the board of directors had a view that we really needed to do more in the non-scripted space. That was, that was a very cost-efficient and very lucrative part of the business. We need to grow that aspect of our business. And so we took a, we sat down with, with the senior management team and we took a look around at the different options. We decided we could organically grow it, but that's very difficult. So we said, let's take a look at all the companies out there that are really prolific in this space and see who we may be able to entice to come on board with an acquisition joint venture strategy. And so we thought, you know, Mark Burnett was really the guy who was the, the Tiffany brand in the space. And so we said, okay, let's go approach Mark. So I helped the company with uh, team up with an investment bank, we approached Mark, and we said, listen, we have an idea, we want to basically bring you into the fold. We then negotiate a purchase transaction and a joint venture and a distribution agreement for all of this product, and now we are basically setting them up and, and putting, bringing in several hundred million dollars of capital financing to basically not only uh, sort of fortify his non-scripted business, which for those of you who don't know, Mark Burnett does, Survivor, Apprentice, Shark Tank, The Voice, et cetera. He, he's, generally the most prolific unscripted producer in, in the world. And now we're setting him up not only to do that business, but also to go into the scripted world where he has a lot of very creative ideas. So that's not something that typically sounds like a lawyer. And it's probably one of the reasons why I love what I do is that because I'm an industry expert, we get involved with the client from the very beginning and we basically take an aspiration or a, or a problem and we solve it generally through the expertise. Um, so you graduated in 92, yes. but you didn't go straight into doing that. You were a certified public accountant first. So what was that process like? Well, I was here at Terry, and I thought it was important to, um, I made a decision, I don't know why or how, but I made a decision that I thought I've been in academics for my whole life. I was a student, just like all of you, and I'd never been out in the world. I'd never got my own cup of coffee. I'd never got up, got dressed in a suit, and drove to work. And, and I thought that that was something that was important. And I looked at the landscape, and at the time, um, 
I had just an affinity for black and white. I like I liked answers. I, I was really, really enjoying my accounting class. <coughs> my father, as I said, was a nomadic accountant. And so I said, I'm going to try that. And I also had a desire to go back to the West Coast, what I thought was on a sample basis, just for a little while. And so I knew that if I did well here at Terry, uh, in the accounting program, that the big six at the time, that's how old I am, uh, would provide opportunities all over the place, including up and down the West Coast. So that's what I did, and that's why I chose the accounting major. Um, and I will tell you to this day, it's probably the, one of the better decisions I've made from a career perspective, because even though I knew at the time I was 99% going to law school, um, the experience of working at KPMG, and I was going to do it for two years to get my license, I actually stayed on for a bonus year because I was enjoying it so much. Um, it's actually how I got my, again, everything in life to me seems to happen by chance. And I started working at KPMG because I liked the guy who was recruiting me. There, I interviewed up and down the West Coast, but at KPMG, it was a former University of Texas football player. In fact, his last game was the 1983 Cotton Bowl where they lost 10 to 9 to Georgia. And the, uh, he was a great guy. When I got to, to LA, he said, I'd like you to work on my accounts. I have Nestle and I have MGM. And I said, well, I don't know, when in Rome, you know, I'll do this. And so for the next three years, I did a lot of media-related accounting and, and special projects. I helped spin out National Geographic. I, I dealt with Family Channel. I helped form what is now Sinclair Broadcasting. I worked with AM Records. And just learned it from a financial side. And as a young accountant, at 22 years old, you get to roam around these companies and ask the CFO questions, and they have to answer you. You know, they, they can't ignore you. They can't blow you off as, you know, an intern. They, they, it's the audit. They have to, they have to engage and, and you learn a tremendous amount about business, about financial statements. And that has really, really helped me in my personal life and my professional mm -hmm. life and executing on behalf of my clients to this day. Um, and one of the clients that really stands out to me is the Olympics. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about what exactly you do for the Olympics? Yes. And how you got involved with that? Yes. So the, the IOC is, is, I mean, I, this is film, so I shouldn't say it. I'll say it's one of my favorite clients. Uh, being a college swimmer here and being a complete Olympic junkie from the time I was a young boy, I love the Olympic movement. I love everything about it. Um, I wasn't good enough to compete, unfortunately, yeah, but um, but now I'm a big part of it. So the way it happened is um, in 2003, the IOC had just gone under a regime change, and President Jacques Rogue came in, and what he wanted to do is the single biggest asset that the Olympics owns is their media rights and their sponsorship rights. So it's their IP. And because the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, which is based in Lausanne, Switzerland, they control the rings and they control the, the broadcast media and digital rights to the Olympic Games globally. And it generates roughly six billion plus per quadrennium, which is a four year period. Uh, so it's a, it's a high revenue producing asset. And it, they, they basically take all of it and give it back to the Olympic family. And so at that point in time, there was a real stagnation in terms of how they had sold their rights, especially in the United States, but globally as well. And they, they came and asked for some advice about how to do it. And, and what I said was, you have this unique asset. You should sell it the way you would sell a company. You should conduct an M&A style auction. You should have a bid process. You should have bid documents. You should bring the bidders to this little tiny town, Lausanne, Switzerland. You should put them all up at the same hotel. You should have them run into each other at the bar because they're the heads of all the major network yeah. sports organizations. They're competitive. And that will garner a tremendous result. Right. And they said, it's never going to happen. It's not going to work. And I said, well, let's try it. So we tried it in 2003. We sold the U.S. broadcast rights to NBC for $2.1 billion, which was a $700 million increase over the last deal. And they said, we like you, let's go sell Canada. And so we sold Canada and then Australia. And then I ran out of English speaking territories and they said, well, you know, let's try, you know, yeah. Japan and, and China, et cetera. And so that's how the relationship started selling their global media rights. I helped them on some sponsorship issues. And then the sort of the most interesting part of the relationship with the IOC is they have a very interesting relationship with the United States Olympic Committee. It's essentially the same relationship you'd expect of a league and a very top team. Mm -hmm. So think of the NFL and the Cowboys or the NBA and what used to be the Lakers. Uh, not so good anymore. But, um, and so I deal a lot with U.S. relations on behalf of the IOC, which puts me in a very interesting position because I'm an Olympic junkie. I'm a huge Team USA mm -hmm. fan, but I spend a lot of my time negotiating against the people in Colorado Springs 
on behalf of the global movement, where I'm pretty much the only American around. Uh, the, the IOC, as you'd expect, is a very melting pot organization, and, and I'm one of the only Americans that, that sort of works on behalf of them. And so it's a little challenging to negotiate against my, my country, but it, course, yeah. I, I've, it's, it's been okay. But it's awesome. been great. It's been really fun. Um, so we've learned a lot about your career path and how you've gotten to where you are. And a lot of us as students are maybe graduating and going to get a job or maybe go to grad school, um, or maybe we're juniors and we're getting an internship. What advice do you have to us as students who are getting ready to, to enter the workplace? Well, I think that um, my experience, you'll find I have a tremendous bias for things that I think are right. So I, I, I basically will give advice as if I'm giving, well, I'm paid to give advice for a living, so maybe yeah. that's what it is. <laughs> but um, if you are thinking about or strongly considering a postgraduate education, an MBA, a law degree, something of that nature, I highly encourage people to leave the academic environment and spend some time in the world. And I don't care whether you're bartending or working at KPMG, but, but having the experience of living outside of the academic world for a few years and working with people on a day-to-day -day basis, working with people that may not be as motivated as you, dealing with difficult situations, getting, dealing with the responsibility of having to be somewhere on time uh, or else there's real consequences, not you blew off the class and I'll make it up, but really real consequences. I mean, that experience, I think, is invaluable. And I think what the reason I say, especially if you're going through a, a period of time where you're going to go back to postgraduate education, when I went back to school, to law school, after working for three years at KPMG, I embraced it with a vigor and a level of excitement and a perspective that I don't think I ever would have had I gone straight through. Would I be in the same place today now? I don't know, maybe. But I think that what I got out of those three years of law school because I had spent time in the world, was dramatic. Um, so I think if you're thinking about that, uh, you know, a bit of a gap to go do something else, and it can be completely unconnected to what you think you may do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, accounting now to me seems highly relevant to what I do, but back then it seemed a little bit of a non sequitur, but you could do things even more completely different. Um, and as far as those that are going out in the workplace right away, I think it's a huge place, the world, and there are so many opportunities, and there are so many jobs, and there's, and you just don't even have any ability to fathom all the opportunities that are out there. And no matter how wonderful the career placement services are now, and they're way, in the information that you have access to now is so much different than in the early 90s, you still don't even have a clue. It, it, there's so many different things out there, and so what you really need to do is find what your passion is, and kind of drive in that direction. And if you don't get there right away, or you wind up waiting a little bit, or not quite finding the permanent job you know, six months out, three months out, what have you, that's okay. Because it's a long career. I mean, most people now are working 65. I mean, so if you graduate at 22, that's, you know, that's 42, 43 years. That's a long time. I mean, I feel like I've been doing what I've been doing forever, and I'm just 44. Uh, and I love my job, so it's, it's not like the days go by slowly. I, I really like what I do. But you get a lot of time, and there's a lot of opportunities, so don't think you need to make a choice right away. Yeah, and that's interesting, because as students, you know, a lot of us just want to go out and do, but to, to take a break, go do something completely different, or get some more experience. Yeah, really. and, and a lot of times, quite frankly, one of the things you can learn in life is from your mistakes. I mean, I, I started at KPMG in July, even though the entering class was not supposed to start until August because I thought I wanted to get the leg up. That was really, really stupid. Yeah. Because I really should have taken another month enjoying myself and, you know, so I was that guy and I'm telling you, please don't be that guy. Um, so in the, um, the Institute for Leadership Advancement, something we really stress and believe in is values-based leadership. Um, if you could go ahead and maybe share two of your core values that kind of guide your actions today and how you kind of define those over the years. Sure. I think that, um, I mean, first of all, integrity has is, is got to be at the top of any list, I think, because you only are as good as your reputation. You're only as good as, especially in my profession, but in all professions, but my profession, I'm supposed to be giving people advice. And they don't call me for a day-to-day -day question. They call me when the house is on fire. They call me when the board has told them they need to execute on a transformative transaction. They call me when a corporate raider is coming to try to take over their company and they don't want to be taken over. They've got an issue and um, they need to know that I'm delivering straight advice. They need to know that I am 
um, thinking about their best interest. And when I deal with counterparties, the other side, both the clients and opposing counsel and bankers and all the people that are across the table from me, need to know that I am as, as good as my word and that they can trust me. And that Because putting together a deal is very different. Most of the time in law, what we see on TV is an adversarial setting where there's a winner and there's a loser. It's black and it's white. You go to court, you argue, and somebody in a robe picks. That's not my job. My job is to sit across the table from you and make something happen collaboratively, which means we need to work together. We may have as adversarial of a dialogue as you'll ever see in any courtroom and maybe beyond, but at the end of the day, you're trying to get to a common goal and common purpose. And you need to trust your partners and you need to trust their representatives. And so integrity is paramount. I mean, it's literally, it's, it's a, there's no room for error there. Um, the second thing is really more of how, being successful and is to be self-aware. I think that you got to know who you are and you got to be honest with yourself. All of us have strengths and all of us have weaknesses. And we're not all good at everything. And one of the things that is a big part of my practice is we started about really around the two, early 2000s, started noticing an influx of high net worth individuals into the film business. And I said, hmm. Why is this? Hmm. Well, people have made a lot of money founding companies like eBay and others, and now they want to, for various reasons, come to Hollywood. And so we, we actually started an aspect of our practice called New Entrance to Hollywood. And what we noticed is a lot of times we were the second law firm mm -hmm. to represent these people. And we started thinking, well, why is that? And what, what, what we found was a lot of these billionaires, one, thought because I can create a brilliant tech company, well, I can do anything. So I can go to Hollywood and invest in movies, and that's easy. Well, it's a different community. It's a different business. And I can use my normal lawyer up in Silicon Valley, and they can do it because if they're good at this, they can be good at that. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that was a lesson that we kind of seized on, and we actually started marketing to that. We started saying, you know, we may not be your first law firm, but we're definitely going to be your last. And it just, it just showed that just because you're excellent at one does not necessarily mean you're excellent at another. You also have to know your strengths. I mean, one of the things you're, you guys are learning about is leadership. And there's not one way to be a good leader. In mm -hmm. fact, well, there actually there is one way to be a good leader. It's your way, right? You have to play to your strengths. You can't look at someone and say, that person's a good leader. I'm going to be like that person. Because you may have a completely different personality, mental state, background, everything than that person. So you can't emulate an ideal in a person. What you can do is you can look around and say, what am I good at? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And pull from different people that you relate to and, and build your own style and, and uh, leadership. And, and in order to do that effectively, you need to be honest with yourself about, mm -hmm. am I the kind of person that can walk in a room and work the room and sell it? Or, or am I more of an introvert and I need more one-on-one -on -one time? And you, you really need to be honest with yourself about your skill sets. And if you are self-aware, and you do build a style of your own based on the good leaders around you and the bad leaders around you, by the way. I mean, one of the things that I found that's been very effective is you can learn a ton about how to act by knowing how not to act. How being in a situation saying, I don't want to be that person. And I mean, and I say that so, somewhat in jest, but I will say that um, you see a lot of ba bad behavior in my business, and so you can learn from it. Yeah, and that's really great too because in the Institute for Leadership Advancement, we really do focus on self-awareness and, and personal mm -hmm. growth and um, that's something we value as an institution. So, um, and that, going back to what you said about working in teams and knowing your strengths, not just for you to be a leader, but how you work in a team environment, I think that was really powerful. So, um, also, so you're living in Hollywood, which we all know it's really hard to make it in Hollywood um, and it's even harder to see the success that you've seen. Um, so what keeps you motivated? It's a fun business. Um, I, what I said a little earlier was find your passion and I completely stumbled upon mine. So again, I'm not really good at telling people exactly how to get where they want to go. Um, but just keep your eyes open and look for things that are fun. And I started working in, in LA as an accountant, thinking I was going to go to law school and go to New York and be a tax lawyer. That's what, that was my dream. I mean, why not? And I was living in LA and, and working on these companies and I just found the business really intriguing. I liked the, the concept of intellectual property and, mm -hmm. and I didn't really realize it was a business and the, the, the behind the scenes of any motion picture is a stack of contracts about that high and um, 
most motion pictures these days cost on average $65, $70 million. They're generally about $50 million of marketing put into them. So you've got $120 million spent before the first ticket is sold. And unlike in a lot of businesses where you can do a lot of market research and demos and, and roll out sample campaigns, this is why you come, you see motion pictures like Pacific Rim that came out a couple weeks ago, which one of our clients did, and it just doesn't work. Um, you would have thought before you put, in that case, a lot more money into it, you would know what's going to work and what's not. And you just don't. And the, the fickleness of the public um, and technology and the way technology changes really is a challenge these days, but it's a great challenge. It's an opportunity. Um, there was a movie that we worked on a couple of years ago that was tailored at a young audience sort of a young adult, dance-themed music movie. And we rolled it out, and obviously the East Coast is three hours ahead of the West Coast. And what was happening is people were starting to go to the, it had a great marketing campaign. People were starting to go to the movie on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And from the theater, they were starting to text, tweet, and other post negative reviews about it. I don't like this, this is a disappointment. And so by the time the theaters mm -hmm. opened on the West Coast, you could literally see the shift and, and the, because wow. they do things called tracking. They track the movies and try to predict how they're going to do, what do we think. And the tracking completely changed from what they expected because the feedback they were getting in real time because of technology, five years earlier, this could have never happened. You know, you'd at least gotten through the opening weekend before there was reviews and things. But now it's happening in real time. And, and these type of things are really exciting. I mean, one of the deals we just did was, um, company up there that you may not recognize the logo is called Tencent. Tencent is one of the largest media companies in China. And China is a huge frontier for both media and sports organizations because it's a huge market. Uh, there's a lot of broadband penetration. There will be a lot more broadband penetration. The regulatory regime is softening because uh, right now there's a quota. You can only release so many foreign movies a year and things of that nature. Um, but we just did a landmark deal. I represent Tencent and we uh, represented them in a deal that was announced at the NBA All-Star Game, where for the next five years, all of the NBA's content, their games, playoffs, et cetera, are going to be uh, made available digitally all over China. It's a multi-year, multi-billion dollar deal. Really, really transformative and something that five, seven years ago, an organization with IP as valuable as the NBA would have been very leery necessarily about licensing that into China given piracy and other concerns. But as the world has evolved, you have deals like this being done and they're being done every day. And it's just, it's a very, very exciting time to be in the media space. Um, and it's so fast paced in, in the media space and in entertainment. So how, as a leader, do you continue to grow and continue to develop to make sure <clears throat> that you don't stay stagnant and that you're always getting better? You have to have a good team. I, I, the thing that's the most critical as you progress in your career, you cannot do it alone. Mm -hmm. From the very beginning, um, when I was a young associate, you know, when I was two years in, I knew there was at least somebody below me theoretically. And, uh, you start building a team and building a relationship. And in fact, it's, it's a little kitschy, um, but it shows my passion for the place. My team, at, my work team at, at Latham is called Team Georgia. Uh, and, you know, I, I have a deal toy in my office. One of the things that, that uh, clients often do for large transactions is they'll give these little deal toys mm -hmm. and they'll be kitschy things. Uh, and a few years back, I sold the DreamWorks film library to Paramount on behalf of DreamWorks. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was one of the harder transactions I've worked on. And the, the, I was sitting in my office after it closed, and all of a sudden they wheel in this um, Vespa, mo moped. like a, But it was red, and it had Georgia stickers all over it, and the G, wow. and the Bulldog. And uh, so in my office to this day, I have a scooter, Georgia-themed scooter, sitting in my office as the consummate deal toy. My my two little boys keep wanting me to bring it home so they can ride it around Manhattan Beach, but that scares my <laughs> wife, so it stays in my office. But, um, you know, so I have this team of people. There, the, the young partner who works with me now, one of the young partners who works with me now, he started working with me as an intern, sat in the office next to me, and we've built this group, and everybody is out there looking for opportunities. Everybody is keeping current, and everybody works together collaboratively. The, I work in an entertainment and sports group of about 20 lawyers, and we have, in my opinion, the most prolific practice in the country. And the reason we do is because we're a team of 20. We're not one or two people. We're not a practitioner. We're a group. We're a team. And we approach everything as a team. We, we approach client service as a team. Because if we have a new engagement, and it may, maybe I get a phone call because I know a banker, or however you get 
you, you get assigned a deal, it may be that my expertise is not as appropriate for this deal. Or it may be that my personality, talk about being mm -hmm. self-aware, yeah. is not as, may, maybe the client is a really big car guy. Mm -hmm. Well, my, one of my partners is a huge car guy. Like I don't care about yeah, cars, but either. he loves it. Okay. So we'll maybe the thing to do is to galvanize the relationship, to make the client comfortable with the attorney, to really create a counseling relationship, is you put a different member of the team in the front position of that deal. And th I think that really is the key to, to our success, is that we are the consummate team, the consummate group. I think chemistry is huge. I mean, I, I, I do everything by analogy. So 19 out of the 20 players on the Los Angeles Kings hockey team live in my little beach town. And the other guy lives in the next beach town. And they all live together in this little tiny beach town. Some of them rent houses together. And they're not the best 20 hockey players in the NHL. But, but they've won two of the last three Stanley Cups because if, if, I don't know how many hockey fans there are, but, but when you watch that team play, they literally never give up. They were down three games to zero. They play as a team. There's so much chemistry among those 19 people because they are a consummate team. It makes them overcome better people better individual talents. And so I think really, really working as a team from the beginning and building it because you can't just go to someone and say, you're on my team, let's, let's, let's have chemistry. It's something that's developed over time with trust, experience, good times and bad. People will fail. Mm -hmm. You cannot be, you've got to, you've got to pick them up, teach them and move on. Um, so that I think is really important. That's great. And we were talking about teamwork and, and building relationships and connections. And I know something as college students we focus on a lot is networking um, and getting to know people, building a network of support. Any words of advice for a college student that you know either wants a job or just wants to build a network of people? Um, yeah, I, I, it's really important. Um, it's probably one of the biggest mistakes I've made in my entire career is not focusing in on that at all, and then when I started focusing in on it, focusing on it inappropriately. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So I never really thought much about it, again, because other, my mental state was, I, had, I, have a, I have a mantra, which is swim your own race, which I think is important, which is you do need to worry about yourself, you do need to take possession of your own career, um, and no one's gonna do it for you necessarily. You need to be protective and thinking about what's the right thing and don't be afraid to ask for it. Much the same way I got in a taxi cab, found the swim coach and begged me, begged him to let me into Georgia. There are experiences in your life where you're going to just have to go for it and you're going to have to be focused. But at the same time, um, you know, I think that building a, a, a network of people that you know and trust is important because life is a long journey. And what I did very poorly mm -hmm. was for the first several years of my life, of my professional life, I didn't focus on it at all. I stayed in touch with my core group of tr really good friends from Georgia, but I didn't stay in touch with the broader network of people I'd met through Terry, because most of my yeah. very, very strong friendships were made in the pool, because that's where I spent most of my time. Um, and so I, I maintained to this day very strong fr friendships with those people, but with a lot of my classmates at Terry, I did a very poor job of staying in touch with. Mm -hmm. I continued that tradition by, by being very poor at staying in touch with my law school classmates. Because again, I, again, my core group of friends that were in my study group, I still talk to to this day, but a lot of my classmates, I really let go by the wayside. Yeah. Then when I finally started to think, I really need to focus on this. As a second year lawyer, I was trying to build relationships with managing directors at Goldman Sachs and CEOs. And of course, they had literally no interest in talking to me because why would they need to talk to the junior guy in the file, you know, one of 12 attorneys? Yeah. What I should have been doing is focusing on building relationships with my peers. Yeah. And thank goodness, about five years into my legal career, I figured this out and started, you know, and by then I had missed a lot of opportunities. So I missed opportunities at Terry. Mm -hmm. I missed opportunities at Virginia. I missed opportunities. The one thing I actually did do all right is I maintained some good relationships at KPMG. Why? I kind of had that weird gap. I don't know, but I did, did a little bit there. Um, but finally, I started focusing on the right thing and building out the network. So what, what I tell people all the time when they come to the law firm, I give actually a lot of uh, speeches on this exact topic, is you're not trying to get business, this is in the context of a law firm environment, you're not trying to get business from your buddy today. But what you're a first year lawyer, when your buddy is the COO, you're gonna be a partner. And then it will, and, but, but this starts today. It's not, just like building a team is, doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Building a network doesn't happen overnight. And it can be, and you don't need to think, I'm gonna go network today. 
Just be a good person, get to know people, try to build a personal relationship. Um, one of the things I do now is I, I tend to get to know people and I find out something about them. And sports and entertainment generally lends itself to I have a favorite a movie, I have a favorite actor, I have a yeah. favorite team. And I'll just try to keep remembering that. And, and when I see something happen with one of a, a, a team or a movie that someone likes, I'll give them a text, just some, hey, listen, saw a good win last night. Things like that. Just little reminders just, just continue to bridge that relationship. And so that when there is an issue, when there is a reason to reach out, you have a personal relationship and you haven't, it hasn't been five years since you've spoken to that person. Gotcha. And that, that's really profound because I think a lot of times maybe we're focusing as students on reaching up to people above us, but building relationships with our peers that can endure is, is something really It's, it's, to. it's, listen, I mean, it's always, it's always fun to shoot up, but it's a long play. And it's easier now with things like Facebook or, yeah. or Snapchat, you know. Um, so perfect. Um, that's kind of all I have prepared right now, but I do want to open it up to the audience for some audience questions. So we have a couple microphones on the floor of some ushers that are going to bring those around. So if you have a, a question for Chris, if you want to just raise your hand, um, they'll bring it to you. And you can stand up, say your name, major, and your year. Yes, perfect. Oh, hi, my name is Asif. I'm a real estate major, uh, and I'm a junior. What's been your favorite company working with uh, throughout your whole time here? You know, it's interesting. They're all fun in their own ways, and some of the, the some of the clients that are fun are not necessarily obvious by what they do. Um, the guy who runs MGM is a really good friend. Um, he's a guy I met. I represented a private equity shop buying half of this company. He used to run a company called Spyglass. They made movies like Sea Biscuit and um, Six Sense, and they had a really good run as a production company. Uh, and one of the things that was in vogue before the financial crisis was private equity shops coming in and investing in talent. So you would basically bring in a, a bunch of capital, you'd empower a producer, and now you own content instead of just making it for the studio. So I actually met him on the other side of the table. He's a South African, former professional football player, really aggressive South African guy. And we hit it off even though we were, we had very hostile discussions. Uh, and then a couple years later, MGM was going through a bankruptcy and they were looking for a management team to come in and bring the company out and bring it back to its former glory. And they reached out to Gary to do a merger with MGM and Spyglass and move him through. So I took this guy through a prepackaged bankruptcy and in December of 2010, we, the company came out of bankruptcy with Gary at the helm. Um, just for some financial information, the stock price at the time was about $19 a share. It's now up to in the 70s. He's done a phenomenal job of guiding the company up from really death door or bankruptcy to being, you know, between Bond and Hobbit and the other things they have going on, a really prolific company. And he's a great guy and he's become a really good friend. And so I really have a special place in my heart. They were also my first client. When I went to KPMG in 1992 and they let me run around and talk to people, my first client was MGM and I had to ask them, like, how do you project how much money you're going to make on your movies? And that's how I really started to learn about the business. So I have a particular fondness in my heart for the lion, and when I hear it roar on the screen, mm -hmm. I, I get a little giddy. Um, and then obviously, the, I mean, the Olympics goes without saying. I mean, I just, it's such a special place in my heart. The, one of the great moments of my entire life was in, 19, in 2010, on the Monday before the opening ceremonies of the Vancouver Olympics, I ran the torch uh, through the streets of downtown Vancouver. Um, it's actually a really big flame. I mean, you got to be careful. Uh, it was really, really cool. Uh, I still have a torch in my house and uh, my little outfit, the whole thing. Um, and so that was really cool. And, and getting, I'm getting to spend a lot of time with the Olympic movement, which is something I believe in personally, uh, is quite is quite special. Good question. Good answer. Um, any other questions? Perfect. Right over here. I have a question um, regarding, I'm a, not a present day student, but a graduate at the University of Georgia. Um, in today's world, everything seems to be so technology oriented, where, you know, your applications are online. And it's very different from when I graduated, where you sat in front of someone and they actually looked you in the eye and they found out a little bit more about you. They feel, felt like that your personality would come through. Now, what advice? do you give to these graduates that have to put online applications to get beyond the online application? That's a great question. Well, going beyond the applications, just to your broader question, um, 
it's a real issue um, for a couple different reasons. And one reason is, is that people are very emboldened by technology. So people will do things in a text, in an email, even on a phone call, they wouldn't do sitting across the table from you. They'll take a position, they'll take a stance, they'll, they'll, they'll display an attitude that they never would do in person. So, um, so one of the things that, that I do in my practice, I'll get back to the online application question in a second. I am on a plane almost every week. I have lots and lots of frequent flyer miles. And because I really believe in both for the counseling aspect of the business and the negotiating aspect of the business, you've got to be in front of people. Uh, I love technology. It's, 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 it's empowered me in ways that I can't even begin to describe. But at the end of the day, to forge a relationship with someone and to get something done effectively, I really believe that still you have to look someone in the face, shake their hand, sit down, talk, see them. That's how communication needs to ultimately be um, uh, ultimately be um, you know, to be effective mm -hmm. as far as the other piece of it is getting to sell yourself as far as resumes as far as interviews and, and I think you've got to push for it I mean I know that there are certain schools that still will allow you for instance when I went to the University of Virginia for law school and they were one of the few schools to have a program where you could go interview and so I got on a plane and I went there and I knew that if I sat in front of someone, I hoped, that I could convince them that I was different and there was things that weren't going to come across on the page. And so I think that you either need to look for those opportunities or you need to manufacture them yourself because there are rules, there are guidelines, there, there's a structure, but there's also ways, to, you know, you can go meet someone if you, you know, find out who is in charge of something and, and try to find a personal relationship because I do believe, I think it's a great question and I think if there's one thing I can tell people is it's efficient to text, it's efficient to email, but at the end of the day, it's more effective to meet people face to face. And so that's that's a great question. Yeah, fantastic question and a great advice to answer. Okay, we have time for about one more question. Um, anyone wanna close us off? Hi, I'm Jenny Atkinson. I'm a 1993 graduate of, oh, of Terry. I actually think I may have met you once <laughs> <laughs> in California. Pierce. But um, uh, I'm also a professor here of risk management and insurance. And a number of my students are here today. So being a lawyer in entertainment and sports, obviously very interesting to, to many of the students here. And I was just wondering, you know, in this class, we actually talk about risk on all kinds of levels from lawsuits to a speculative risk. Um, and I was wondering what, what kind of risk do you think are facing this industry right now that you might be involved with, or even some of the technology, maybe with the Sony cyber breach, things of that nature? Well, there's a lot of risks. So I'll hit a few of them. I mean, one of my clients, in fact, Tim Jim, produces the James Bond franchise uh, with Sony. And Sony has just faced one of the largest, if not the largest, hackings in, in US history. And it is, it is dramatic. Um, the impact of that on that company and its relationships is will not be known for a very long time. And um, so the, maintaining security in today's world, I mean, it's very interesting to me um, because your generation seems to be fascinated with telling everybody about everything you're doing at all times. <laughs> and so the concept of privacy is almost sort of sort of a bad word. It's like, well, no, I, you know, I want everyone to know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm posting right now. And, uh, and so, but when you get into a business context, there was actually the CIO of Sony was interviewed not too long ago before this happened. And he was like, his, the gist of his statements were, we're a creative community. We can't run this like a bank or an insurance company. We have to have a free flow of information. Our security is good enough. Well, obviously it wasn't. And, and the impact it's had, I mean, you know, my client and the producers of James Bond are furious because they, they hold these scripts, and maybe it's idiosyncratic and maybe it makes a difference, but they hold these scripts and these stories to be sacrosanct, and they don't even file them with the copyright office in advance, the way you should legally, um, because they want to keep them secret, and now they're out there. And, and so that's something that's really dramatic um, you know, from a security perspective and a risk perspective that's facing all industries, and the entertainment industry in particular. Um, these entertainment companies have a lot of sensitive information. I mean, they have Tom Cruise's social security number. I mean, who wouldn't want that? <laughs> and uh, so they got to be very careful with this. Um, on the sports side, the concussion lawsuits are a real issue um, because what you're seeing is beyond the NFL, you're starting to see youth sports and you're starting to see what we'll call Olympic sports. I mean, water polo, 
soccer, the, they're getting implicated. And it, the, the effect it's going to have is unclear, but it's, it's, it's a, something that's a real issue in the sports space to look at from a, from a liability and a risk perspective. Um, so those are two issues that I really think about. And, and then just the business challenge of technology. I mean, it used to be in the motion picture business, you could sell someone the same movie 10 times. You go buy a movie ticket, then you buy a DVD, and then you get a pay-per-view, and then you get HBO, and then you watch it on cable, and then you watch it on free TV. Now they can't do that. Consumers want to have the ability to access scripted content on any device, whenever they want, for one purchase price. And so the, the business model has been completely disrupted. It's a different risk, but it's an economic challenge that needs to be faced. Well, perfect. Um, that kind of concludes uh, what we're going to be doing right now. But before you leave, we wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much for coming and spending your time with us today. Um, perfect, yes. And on behalf of the Institute for Leadership Advancement um, and the Terry College of Business, this is a picture of the arch only given to Terry Leadership um, oh, Speaker Series fantastic. presenters. So perfect. And one more round of applause for Mr. Chris. Perfect. Thank you. That's awesome. And... We'd also like to thank you guys for coming today. So our next Terry Leadership Speaker Series is on March 27th with Arthur Blank, and he's the owner of the Atlanta Falcons. Um, if you are here for class today, make sure you fill in your cards and then drop them um, when you exit the chapel. And thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful Friday.